We'll uh, do the three presentations. We'll make sure to take a break in between each one to get another drink. Um, the way we will decide the winner is by your applause. Uh, you ready to take it away? Uh, pretty much. Yeah. It's all yours. This is the data source that's being visualized. The Australian Women's Register. It's a data graph of biographical records about notable women. So those are people who have had archives about them, either because they themselves were uh, uh, artists or uh, politicians or writers, um, or they're you know, famous enough to have had people writing about them that you know, therefore they're represented in the archives. Um, this data set is published by the eScholarship Research Centre at the University of Melbourne, um, and it consists of a, a number, about 5,000 uh, XML records. Um, it's published also as a website, but this visualisation is based on XML records that have been harvested using the Open Archives Initiative protocol for metadata harvesting. Firstly, we use the Open Archives Initiative protocol for, uh, ex to extract the 5,000 XML records um, from the server at the ESRC in Melbourne. Um, and then I wrote an XSLT that I applied to each one of those records, which selected out just certain pieces of information from the records, which are quite rich in terms of biographical data about those people, and I was looking at only a few of the important relationships so that I could visualise those things. Um, so the XSLT converts those XML records into RDF XML, producing about 5,000 XML RDF graphs. Um, those graphs are then pushed into a Sparkle store, or a triple store, um, to produce an aggregate of all of the records at once. Then I write a Sparkle query to extract the data out into a tabular form. I load that table CSV file into the Cytoscape tool, press the visualisation button, and it produced a fabulous visualisation. Fantastic, um, which was great because most of the work, as you can imagine, is in preparing the data, and as it turned out, the actual visualization tool itself was a doll, it was a snap. So, about the data set, just quickly, we've got um, people and groups. Um, so, the individual people are you know, uh, notable women, the groups are often like their feminist groups, they may be political parties, that sort of thing. Um, the individuals also have named occupations which are either they might be paying jobs or they might just be you know, avocations, if you like. And in the visualisation, the, the people, the groups and the occupations are all represented <coughs> as nodes, as the dots on the graph. And the, uh, the group membership is indicated by purple lines that link a group to its members. Uh, the occupation membership are green lines between individuals and their occupations. So the interesting thing about the, the visualisation then is the way that those relationships end up producing a graph in which um, uh, which uh, related occupations ended up being situated, you know, approximately on the on the graph, um, and you know, occupations and, and groups sort of move around um, to produce a graph in which overall the tension of the graph um, is is minimised. And if you like, all of the little nodes are kind of um, they are repelling each other as if they are statically charged. And what's holding them together are the, the relationships between those nodes, which are like stretchy rubber bands. And overall. You know, there's these two competing forces which end up producing a, the graph that you'll see. So interesting things to note about this graph, if you zoom in, um, you can have a poke around and see what these nodes actually are. This cluster of occupations here, these are all the people who have a common occupation, which is the node in the centre. Those are political, uh, those are parliamentarians. And so it's interesting to note how, how um, distant the politicians are <laughs> from the rest of the population. Um, an interesting other group of outliers around the bottom are sports people. Here we, these nodes represent um, gold medal winners from you know, Olymp uh, Olympics and Commonwealth Games and things like that. Um, also particular types of sports, so there are swimmers, there are clusters of swimmers and uh, cyclists and netball players and things like that. Um, again, they're not very closely tied to the other notable uh, women. Um, but within the centre of the graph, you have a much more a much more dense um, and interrelated set of nodes. Um, we have here; uh, these are uh, up around here are journalists of various kinds, TV journalists, um, radio journalists, and so on. Um, uh, around the other part, we have sort of social social working people, um, <coughs> medical medical you know, nurses, social workers, and so on. So very interesting to see. Um, I think, although I haven't spent a lot of time yet exploring the graph very interesting to see the way that those social relationships end up being represented spatially. Fantastic. Well done. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm, jo I'm Adam. This is Josh. <laughs> we're, both from, right? we're both from Perth. Don't hold it against us. 
Um, we're programmers at CSIRO and I guess the shortest way to describe what we do is to try to help link scientists and, and data. So um, yesterday we were introduced to Janet Newman who's a crystallographer also at CSIRO. Um, crystallographers, for those that don't know, basically try to create crystals out from combining different, different combinations of proteins and chemicals in tiny little droplets on trays. Um, the formations of these crystals is unpredictable and it's difficult to, to know um, what combinations you need to create crystals so the crystallization process isn't always consistent. Some conditions are more conducive to crystallization than others. Um, there's been a lot of work done. Um, these are, the, these are the, the examples of the droplets here. There's been a lot of work done in identifying um, the crystals like this uh, out of the data sets. These are the ones that haven't crystallized. What we're interested in looking at is trying to see if we can find relationships between these uncrystallized forms to better understand the process and thereby help create more um, reliable methods of creating crystals um, in the future. So we were given a, a few thousand of these images along with some pre-rendered masks. Um, this is the mask here. Basically this just identifies the area of interest on the subject picture. The black stuff we're not interested in when it's overlaid there. Um, that helps us eliminate any noise so that we can just focus on what we want. Um, we looked at several algorithms to, to do this. The, the difficulty we had is that it's very hard to identify specific features of interest. So um, there's a, there are certain characteristics like the darkness or lightness, um, different ge geometric properties. Uh, similarity could be any number of those different things or any permutations or, or combinations of them. Um, these are examples here of the software that we've got. So the idea of, of this software is that Josh has selected a target uh, picture. And we're basically saying we want to find other pictures that look similar. And as you can see, it's done a pretty good job. It's picked, it's picked pictures that show this crystallization um, occurring. There are other sample sets. This is, this is really the, the real use case. So we've picked a, an image that doesn't have crystallization. We want to say, show me all the others that look like this. And it's done a reasonably good job of picking out similar things. I'm not sure if that might be showing crystallization there. I'm not 100% sure. But there are issues with it. Um, it's not perfect. This last example shows where it really starts to, to struggle. Um, in this case, we've got an image that doesn't have crystallization and it's gotten a bit confused and picked a lot with crystals, but we think it's a pretty good proof of concept. Um, we've, we've found some white papers discussing um, more sophisticated similarity techniques, but it's difficult to implement those in two days. So um, <laughs> we think it, it, it gives us a push in the right direction, though. Um, we've had good feedback from Janet, who says that this kind of thing is going to be useful. Um, I guess we're, we're thinking about trying to do something a little bit more sophisticated with the OpenCV library, that's Open Computer Vision Library. Um, but yeah, hopefully it's, it's going to help someone create more crystals. Thank you very much. Fantastic. You can please welcome Anna in the third and final competitive entry. Thank you. So this is the Butterfly Project, which is exploring the fundamental interconnectedness of all things. So, so I was interested in the butterfly effect, which from Chaos Theory is described by uh, Ed Lorenz, is where small changes in one part of a deterministic nonlinear system can have large changes elsewhere in that system. So for example, a butterfly flaps its wings here and halfway across the world causes a hurricane. <laughs> so, or as Douglas Adams puts it, what we are concerned with here is the fundamental interconnectedness of all things. The connection between causes and effects are often much more subtle and complex than we with our rough and ready understanding of the physical world might naturally suppose. So in order to explore this idea, uh, conveniently we have access to a global network of sensor data streams 
essentially observing the very small changes that occur locally. And I thought, how can we make use of those data streams to identify patterns or correlations between seemingly unrelated streams of data? So what I've done, uh, there are three parts to this project. The first is a sensor unit, which is here. So this is an electronics project. And what I've done is taken a DHT11 temperature and humidity sensor, which is a fairly standard uh, sensor unit, and connected it up to an Arduino microcontroller. And I've programmed this microcontroller using the Arduino wiring language to pull the sensor every minute. So this is the metaphorical butterfly, if you like. Um, and what it does is it publishes the data via a serial connection. Uh, to the second piece of the project, which is a Java application which listens to that serial connection, parses those CSV values, and then pushes them up, them up to the cloud to a service called COSM. And COSM is basically designed for publishing data streams from the Internet of Things. Uh, so then we can take that, that stream of data and other streams of data from you know, unrelated sensors or similar sensors all around the world and aggregate them into a data visualization. So if we take a look, this is the sensor data stream that's being produced by this butterfly uh, running on, on COSM. And I might actually just pop to a separate window here. So this is, you can see we've got uh, graphs being generated over time. Uh, it's, it's remained pretty constant recently, but uh, you can see earlier on I was blowing on the sensor to make it change, and the humidity was also, <laughs> was also changing, um, and the dew point has changed just recently. But there are other people who publish data streams. For example, this is a stream that I discovered through the uh, API of COSM in Canberra, which I don't even know who's running that, but I can make use of it. Uh, and we can put those together into something like this data visualization, which is a Voronoi visualization that uh, we can then use to explore the data. And I must say that this is actually running on just random data, I didn't have time to integrate any meaningful data sets into this, but uh, you can see the idea of, of what we would do. So it's my hope that as the Internet of Things grows and as the amount of sensor data available online increases, that tools like this uh, can contribute to an improved understanding of the nature of the fundamental interconnectedness of all things. Here, here. All right, so I'm now going to ask my judges to come up. Um, uh, and each judge is uh, going to defend very uh, passionately why they think you should actually vote uh, for the contestant they're representing. Um, Connell, why should you vote for Connell? Connell, in a three-minute presentation to the judges, produced knowledge from data. You know, and you can't argue with that. He had a beautiful visualization which actually showed knowledge from data, and that's what e-research is about. The interesting um, contrast between what uh, these guys have done versus what all the other contestants were doing is all the other contestants went back to their own knowledge and built from that. These guys were clever enough to scour the rest of the world for what other clever people had done and built on top of that. And I am a total proponent of reuse. And I'm afraid that's the only way that a relatively small country can beat its way up um, against Ooh. all the other people. <laughs> yeah. 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 If you reinvent everything, you end up with the wheel in five years' time. It's already there. I think that's why these guys have absolutely won. Oh, air, air. Well so I think Anna really, really touched on the point that she didn't even really know where the data was coming from. And that really exemplifies what this project is all about. It really touches on creativity, standards, reuse, ease of use. It hides the detail of what you're doing with the front end away from the user, the researcher. And it's an idea that can scale to be absolutely huge, to look at potentially millions of data feeds from around the world. It took her 24 hours to build that, okay? And that is really, really good because it builds on existing frameworks, existing standards, the Arduino, et cetera, et cetera. It uses the Nectar Cloud, which is a big tick for us. Um, <laughs> and it automatically plugs into real-time feeds, as I said, potentially millions of them, and it can scale out. And really, this whole idea of exemplifying, you know, the networks, the neurons, to ne uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a sensing of networks, connections into our minds to examine how we can look at the world in a much better and more effective way. So I think that's why. There it is. Uh, this will be for Anna in three, two, one. I think everybody knows the winner, Anna. Come on up. Big round of applause. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> this is going to be a fun event. Uh, I got an app for that. I should download an app for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah.